Let's get it on then, shall we? Mwah. Welcome to Sex on the Peach, your weekly hump day dose of everyone's favourite untalked about topic, sex. Let's get honest, let's get open, let's get comfortable, and let's get in to this week's show. Friends, lovers, listeners, happy Wednesday, happy hump day, and happy Sex on the Peach day. Today we are here to discuss the fact that everyone's a little bit toxic. Yes, it's a word that dominates our everyday lives at this point. Thank you, Brittany. It's literally one of the most overused words in the English language, and God damn it, I am going to heavily contribute to that today. Now, some of my episodes are heavily rooted in research and education, because it's something we are so sorely missing in school in terms of sex and relationships. This is not one of those episodes. It's giving opinion. It's giving experience. It's giving the amount I say it's giving being the most toxic thing about the entire episode altogether. But yes, in today's episode, we delve into the concept of toxic behaviour. Toxic. It literally means poison. That's what we're dealing with. If toxic people were a product you could swallow, they'd come with a warning label and be sealed up tight to keep you safe. But what I will say is I believe that toxic is a spectrum. There's the toxic that's relatable. It has no real long-term consequence. It's for the plot, as we say. It's youthful. It's kind of funny. It's like the amount of cyanide in apple seeds. It won't kill you, but it's definitely there and very much existing. And then there's the kind of toxic where you might as well just rename yourself arsenic. So yes, we are going to dive into the treacherous waters of dating. When navigating through the sea of love can mostly feel like dodging toxic waste barrels. Not only will I be giving my thoughts on the spectrum of toxic, I'll also be reading your confessions, answering some questions, and we will find out the results of the toxic polls. And I'll be announcing the winner of the Balesa Air Vibe giveaway, which I promise will give you a more intense orgasm than the most toxic of fuckboys out there. So join me as I unravel the layers of toxic behaviour, discuss its impact and explore strategies for overcoming toxic patterns in our lives. Okay, let's get into it. Here is... The Toxic Tango. Toxic behaviour. It's a term that's very casually thrown around nowadays. But what exactly does it entail? At its essence, toxic behaviour can manifest in various forms, from subtle manipulation to overt aggression but the underlying impact is always the same. Harm. So it will probably come as no surprise to any regular listener of Sex on the Peach that the thing I blame for toxic behaviour is society. It's the media. I know society romanticises intense emotions, the fights, the drama, the roller coaster as love. And for a long time, I believed it and I lived for it. I'm not going to lie, every time someone tells me that they think I'm wise in this space, it's nice. But babe, as I always say, I learned my way here. I don't want anyone thinking I had any of this figured out. I was a toxic fucking she-devil. More apple seed than arsenic, sure, but still, I did it. But the key word is was. 
because we have to learn and we have to start wanting better for ourselves because the truth is real love feels safe. It's not about constant anxiety or walking on eggshells. It's about feeling secure and respected in your relationship. Whether that is with a romantic partner or partners, whether that's with friends and within your platonic relationships, and probably most importantly, your relationship with yourself. When we're younger, we are usually too naive to understand what real love and respect look like. Instead, we settle for temporary highs and fleeting moments of validation. And yeah, they feel good. We know this. They release literal feel-good chemicals into your system. But we don't learn otherwise. So all of a sudden, we're fully adulting in the real world and toxic behaviour still has a way of weaving its insidious threads into our lives. And what was once considered fun or funny, now leaves a bitter fucking taste in our mouths. It's time to confront the harsh reality that it gets to a point where toxic behaviour, it's not cute anymore. And listen, there is a time when toxicity feels like it reigns supreme. From leaving people on red to playing mind games, we almost revel in the chaos. But as we reflect on those peak toxic moments and listen, yeah, it's funny to look back on, kind of, ish, but it has now become downright destructive. It's time to break free from the toxic cycle and reclaim our sanity. Are you ready to tango away from toxic? Then let's do this. To all my fellow toxic kings, queens and friends out there, I say this. It's time to let go of the toxicity and embrace a healthier, happier future. Trust me, you will thank yourself later. Now, we've probably all had our fair share of toxic relationships. And there is a strange certain thrill to it that's kind of hard to deny. The drama, the mind games, the emotional roller coasters. It's like we were all starring in our own real life soap operas. And honestly, there's moments where it feels kind of exhilarating, but let's not sugarcoat it. Toxic relationships are exhausting. They drain you mentally, emotionally, and physically. And yet, despite the chaos and the turmoil, There's a certain allure to it all. It's like we get addicted to the drama, unable to resist the pull of the toxic cycle. And for a while, I was all in. It was like a twisted form of entertainment and I was hooked. Toxic was the name of the game. I lived for the thrill of the chase, the adrenaline rush of the drama. And secondary school and college were like a breeding ground for this toxic behaviour. We thrived on it. Although, I will say this, I never hooked up with anyone at my secondary school or college. As people might already know, I went to a musical theatre school and college and the female to male ratio at the time was about 10 to 1. The boys were having a good time. And I thought I was so forward thinking because I refused to get involved with it. And every time another girl in another year would be crying because the guy they liked had slept with someone else because the straight boys had a fucking monopoly in that building, I was like, babe, what did you expect? Like, who the fuck did I think I was, 15 years old, trying to give it queen of wisdom? Like, surely you knew this was going to happen? (laughs) Everyone is horny as fuck. These boys are running rampant. Of course they weren't giving it monogamous at 16 years old at a musical theatre college where everyone was constantly one ballet class away from a blowjob. Like, it was a lot of sexual energy in that building every single day. And I was like, nope. (laughs) I would like to add at this point, I did not carry this attitude further in life and have made the mistake of mixing business with pleasure far more times than I would care to admit. 
But in college, I was giving mature decisions. Outside of college, a walking concern. It was really toxic for a long time. And I felt like I thrived on being that girl that people would say, this would only happen to you. And when it came to dating, I felt like the more work I constantly put into something, the more it meant something. Even if that effort was not texting to make a point or being distant to get someone's attention, I almost thrived on fuckboy energy, even if I really liked someone. And that's just fucking stupid. It's literal self-sabotage. And here's the thing, toxic might have been fun, but it's not sustainable. Because eventually you realize that you deserve more than just games and drama. You deserve real love, real respect, real happiness. Instead of spending nights locked in heated arguments or stewing in silent resentment, we want something more meaningful. Or maybe we don't. If you still want toxic, I don't know. I guess you do you. But We crave connection, fulfillment, and we want to invest our time and energy in things that bring us joy. Our careers, our friendships, our passions, our personal growth. Whilst disagreements are a natural part of any relationship, they should never descend into toxic territory. We deserve to feel safe and supported in expressing our feelings without fear of judgment or retaliation. It's time to realize that your emotions and your needs, they actually matter. No relationship should make you feel like you are constantly questioning your worth. There are some things we shouldn't have to put up with or settle for and I want better for you. I want you to reach a point where you realize I deserve better. Why give someone the power to make you feel like shit? Our time and our energy are really precious resources and we actually can't afford to waste them on emotional roller coasters and mind games. Side note, this is probably going to come across as the most hypocritical, contradictory episode ever because I'm literally like, I was toxic. Don't be toxic. But trust me, I just want to use my fuck ups to help you not make them. And if you still want to, then by all means, go ahead. All I can do is pass on what I know, which is that it can all feel like a big old waste of time, mostly for yourself. Now, the way people throw around the term toxic nowadays can also feel like a bit of a quick fix. It's like slapping a label on someone instead of diving deeper into what's really happening in the relationship or within ourselves. And that's largely the fault of social media trends. These buzzwords catch on really fast, but do we really stop to consider what they mean and how they should be used? As I touched on in my episode, The Jonah Hill I'm Willing to Die On, Therapeutic language has made its way into daily conversation in a way that allows people to throw it around completely incorrectly. Also, therapists don't label people toxic, FYI. So stop calling people toxic and using your therapist as an excuse to do this. But it is a prime example of this buzzword bullshit. It's all over the place. But have you ever noticed there's no clear-cut definition of what makes a person toxic? And is it ethical to hastily label someone as toxic? Because not all people labelled as toxic are inherently malevolent. And labelling someone as such carries a binary of good versus evil with the labeller positioned firmly in the good category. So instead of casually throwing around the toxic label, unless it's based in something really necessary, we can also try saying someone isn't good for me or doesn't feel healthy or right for me. This also shifts the focus from always blaming the other person to recognising our own role in deciding who we want in our lives. It's about taking control and making choices that are right for us. But for today, let's look at the spectrum of toxic, from appleseed to arsenic. 
So when we're looking at apple seed toxic, a lot of times this is behavior that could be solved with people just being honest. Because a lot of behavior that is deemed toxic is because of people who quite simply just aren't that into you which is a shite pill to swallow sometimes. None of us like feeling rejected, but take a moment because I'm pretty damn sure there's been times that you haven't been into someone. It isn't personal. We can't connect with everyone. And it's okay to not be into someone like that and for them not to be into you. But again, this could be solved by a conversation rather than shitty apple seed tactics. Like, let's talk about the ever-elusive ghoster. You know, that special someone who disappears faster than a fucking magician's rabbit when things start to get a tad too real. One minute, you're exchanging sweet nothings over text, and the next, they're gone, leaving you with more unanswered questions than the Kate Middleton conspiracy theories. Where the fuck did they go? Who knows? But ghosting is the Houdini act of the dating world and we're all just left scratching our heads in confusion. Stop messaging them. Let them go. They're not fucking worth it. Like, just have the courage to say, this isn't for me. Get it together, ghosters. And let's also shine a spotlight on the breadcrumb enthusiast. Fuck boy energy. This charming individual loves nothing more than to sprinkle you with tiny crumbs of affection, just enough to keep you hooked. They'll hit you with sporadic compliments, occasional emojis, and maybe even the occasional what you doing text at 2am when they are feeling particularly lonely. But ask for commitment or clarity? No, no, that's too much. They would rather keep you dangling like a forgotten Christmas ornament waiting for the day they remember that you exist. It's literally playing emotional hopscotch. You are jumping through hoops of uncertainty. Let them go. They are not fucking worth it. And let's not forget the drama kings and queens out there. Now this used to be me, so I own this fully. (laughs) thriving on chaos with a healthy dose of passive aggressive Instagram posts. For me, this was because things weren't really right for me and I didn't understand why I wasn't feeling the way I thought I was supposed to and I was trying to find things to, I don't know, set my soul alight, even down to the degree that People around me seemed to get so angry and argumentative about outside people in their relationships. And I thought I was supposed to feel that way. So if my partner was texting or spending time with someone that other people deemed inappropriate, I would cause a huge argument about it, even though deep down, I didn't really care. (laughs) I was young and I was emotionally immature and I didn't realize I felt differently about monogamy than I was being told I was supposed to feel. If I ever found out something damning about a partner, instead of just being like, hey, I found this out, I would come up with tales more elaborate than the entire Lord of the Rings franchise to try and get my partner to tell me themselves. Why? so I could have the satisfaction of knowing they were willing to be honest and respect me when under pressure, that was a low fucking bar for myself. And I was only wasting my own time because if they respected me in the first place, they either wouldn't have done the fucking thing or they would have told me themselves before me finding out. I thought arguments were a sign that we cared more. And I thrived on angry makeup sex. It was ridiculous. But realistically, I wasn't being true to myself. But I'd actually say that toxic sex was my real downfall. And I know I still joke that I love people who have more red flags than a matador. But listen, I was drawn to toxic sex like a moth to a flame. And I think that we should talk about this idea that when a relationship gets toxic, the bedroom action somehow gets better. And is there any truth to that? Because We've all had sex with someone we would deem as toxic and been like, it was sadly fantastic. But diving into the psychology of toxic relationships, we can kind of unpack 
why some people might cling to the physical side of things even when the emotional part is in shambles. As I've already mentioned, toxic relationships are like roller coasters of emotional intimacy. So when everything else feels rocky, sex can become this weird lifeline of closeness. It's like the one place where you can still feel connected, even if everything else is falling apart. Plus, there's all the brain chemistry stuff happening during sex, dopamine, serotonin, you name it. So if the relationship is lacking in other areas, your brain might just latch on to the feel-good chemicals from sex and hype them up. But sex isn't just physical. It's emotional too, whether we like it or not. So when you're getting down and dirty with your ex, it's not just about getting your fucking rocks off. It's a space for releasing that pent-up anger and resentment and maybe even reclaiming a bit of your self-worth because it feels like a space of validation for all of those lingering feelings that are probably being projected physically. But the bottom line is that sex with an ex or a toxic situationship might feel amazing because it's giving you an emotional release and validation that you aren't getting through other means. And our generation has grown up with a steady diet of toxic relationships disguised under the veil of sexual tension, leading us to see this as the norm or even the ideal. We are bombarded with images of aesthetically pleasing but emotionally draining relationships portrayed as hot and sexy on a screen, but they are fucking disastrous in real life. So let's not confuse great sex with a healthy relationship. Let's release the grip on those who have caused us pain and also hold ourselves to a higher worth than letting people who hurt us have access to that part of ourselves. You can also have amazing sex with people who care about you and respect you. Listen, we can all be guilty of exhibiting less than ideal behaviours and these are the kind of things that we can most likely look back on and be like, lol, what the fuck were we doing? But realising that you might be the one allowing or perpetuating this can be a real wake-up call. It was for me anyway. You will see yourself in a different light. So what do you do when that uncomfortable truth hits you? First off, check yourself. Take a moment to reflect on your actions and acknowledge the impact they might be having on others, which is not easy, but it's the first step towards making things right. Stay open to feedback from those around you, which might sting a bit, but their insights can be invaluable in helping you see things from a different perspective. And dig a little deeper to understand why you're behaving the way you are. Is it past experiences? Is it insecurities? Or is it just bad habits that you've let yourself get into? Figuring out the root cause can really help. I know it did for me anyway And realizing that trying to adhere to the rules and the stereotypical relationship ideals that society puts on us just didn't work for me. And owning that and accepting that it's okay to feel a little differently changed everything for me. So once you've got a handle on all of that, you can then commit to some changes, set some goals, create a game plan and stick to it. For me, that was just being open and honest about everything. And sometimes that's difficult. It means some unnerving and very hard conversations, but I have committed to that and I want to be true to myself and do that. And in the long run, I feel much healthier and happier for it. And that's also because I leaned on my support system for backup and encouragement along the way. And the real ones will be there for it through the good and the bad. So I encourage you to do the same. I mean, I went through a situation last year that turned really toxic and I could not have done it without the people who were there to see me through it because it's all a journey that isn't easy, but with a little kindness and perseverance, you can become the best version of yourself and you will only have healthier relationships with yourself and everyone else as a result of that. 
But we do also need to talk about toxic patterns that you might be seeing in your relationship that we are not going to look back on and be like, ha ha, what a time that we are not going to joke about. The arsenic toxic. Because the word has become diluted as fuck, it has lost its power a bit. And as I've said, toxic behaviour spans a spectrum, but I work in an industry where I see a lot of arsenic. For anyone who follows me on social media, we all know I don't hold back when it comes to the penis owners of the musical theatre industry, usually around the 5 foot 10, 11 mark, I still love you. But I feel like I've been consumed by this behaviour since I was a literal teen. At one point, I was in a cast with someone who pulled all of the men of that company into his dressing room and told them not to speak to his girlfriend who was also in the company. Under any circumstances, they were not to talk to her. This is arsenic. This is what I'm talking about. Things like emotional manipulation, using guilt, fear, shame to control others, love bombing, gaslighting, distorting reality and undermining someone's perception of events. Jealousy, possessiveness, and attempting to control a partner's interactions. Passive aggressive behavior, indirectly expressing hostility or resentment through subtle actions or remarks. Stonewalling, withdrawing from communication, and refusing to engage in conflict resolution. You find yourself hollow at bedtime, and you wake up feeling just as miserable. Witnessing happy couples fills you with a pang of envy because it feels bad all the time. Questions and statements from your partner feel like traps. They make you feel like you're being hunted. They make you feel like you are under surveillance. There's no forgiveness. Mistakes are used as constant evidence of your inadequacy. Nothing gets resolved. You avoid expressing your needs because there's no point, because attempts to communicate them often lead to fights, empty promises or accusations. All the work, the love, the compromise comes from you. When no becomes a dirty word because your partner only accepts you when you agree with them. Whatever you're going through, they are going through worse. In a healthy relationship, both partners take turns supporting each other. So if your needs are consistently overlooked, it's a big no from me. There's no effort. Your partner's physical presence doesn't equate to emotional investment in the relationship. When there's no effort to love, spend time together or share important aspects of your life, a relationship becomes draining. Constant invasion of privacy. It's demeaning and controlling. Everyone deserves privacy and trust in a relationship. The lies. The constant lying. No. If your voice is consistently sidelined. No. Your opinions and feelings matter in a healthy relationship. And if we are at the worst end of all of this, physical or verbal abuse. Or both. You don't need me to tell you that any form of abuse is unacceptable and needs immediate action to save yourself. These kinds of toxic behaviour can have very profound effects on our mental and emotional well-being. It fucks up trust, it undermines self-esteem and it creates a negative cycle of conflict and resentment. It can cause anxiety, depression, low self-worth feelings of powerlessness. And toxic relationships don't discriminate based on strength or independence. Even the most resilient and confident people can find themselves in the suffocating grip of toxicity. The amount of people who have asked me why I stayed in abusive relationships in the past with no knowledge of how it feels to be in an abusive relationship is astounding. 
Relationships that initially sparkle with love and promise can absolutely deteriorate into darkness. And that was a massive flaw of mine because I was constantly looking back and hoping it would go back to that. But that's never going to happen because the further into your relationship you get, the more true colors you are seeing. And yes, some relationships are flawed from the start and marked by red flags, but others begin with all the right ingredients, but sour over time, whether that's unresolved issues, jealousy, past hurts, and not all relationships turn toxic because the person you initially fell for was toxic. Relationships are dynamic, they evolve, they shift, and sometimes they collapse entirely. We can never predict how things are going to unfold when our partner's less charming qualities are exposed. Yes, love is a beautiful thing. I love love. But it can also blind us to warning signs and lead us into toxic situations. It's very easy to become enamored with the idea of love, but sometimes it's only after we are knee-deep in commitments like children and mortgages that we realize something essential has been missing all along, ourselves. And if all you've ever known is toxic relationships, you might settle for it. You might think, well, they're all kind of screwed up anyway, so I might as well stick with what I know. And I get it. Leaving a toxic relationship is scary. But as someone who has been there, it's not worth it. Once you break free from the toxic tango, you will look back and wonder why you didn't do it sooner. You will realize that starting over was the best decision you ever made. When I look back at my previous toxic relationships, it literally feels like waking up from a bad dream and wondering how I ever tolerated half of it in the first place. And I'm sure there are people who feel like that about me too. (laughs) Even though in the moment, it felt like there was no way out because leaving isn't easy, especially if there is manipulation or abuse involved. And what I hate about this topic is I feel like It's a lot of telling people who are on the receiving end of toxic behavior how to leave rather than telling people who are dishing out the toxic behavior how to fucking stop. But I keep it very real here. The majority of those people won't be listening to this podcast. The majority of those people wouldn't listen to this podcast and think for a single second that this is about them. The majority of truly arsenic-style toxic people don't want to change. I always hold space for those who do if they are out there because I believe people are capable of change if they want to and they are serious about it, but it's unlikely. I have had conversations with multiple therapists about people with narcissistic personality disorder. And as long as people are willing to engage and put up with their behavior, they don't see a need or a desire to change. So the best thing for people to do is leave, which feels shitty. It feels like victim blaming. And I wish I could tell you something different right here and now. I wish I could come on here and tell you, I've cured narcissism. But for now, this is what I've got. (laughs) A toxic relationship is like a broken record. It keeps playing the same harmful tune over and over again. And despite our best efforts, we might be tempted to believe that we can fix it, tweak it, or somehow find a magical solution to make things right. But the truth is, if change was possible, it would have happened already. Toxic people might promise change, but it's highly improbable. And even if they do change, it's usually only temporary. The sad reality is that nothing external can alter them. The damage they cause will continue and it will leave broken hearts and shattered relationships in their wake and you will probably be a part of that. Because rather than taking responsibility, they will always find someone else to blame. Remorse, regret, reflection, insight, they are foreign concepts to them. They will just double down on their toxic behavior and leave a trail of fucking destruction behind them. And that's why leaving a toxic relationship is like navigating through a minefield. 
even though you know it's for the best, the journey is a lot. When you try to break free from a toxic person, things will often escalate before they improve. And this is because toxic people thrive on maintaining control and will resort to even more manipulative and hurtful behavior to keep you in their grasp. When you dare to question their behavior or attempt to change the dynamics of their relationship, they will pull out all of the stops to bring things back to their version of normal. It's exhausting. But in the midst of the turmoil, you might find yourself reverting to old patterns of behavior, giving more of yourself in a desperate attempt to salvage the relationship. It's a natural response, but it only serves to prolong the dysfunction. And this makes breaking away from a toxic relationship feel like you're fucking tearing at barbed wire with your bare hands, because each attempt to free yourself just inflicts more pain. Until you finally realize that the source of that agony isn't the tearing away, it's the relationship itself because it's sharp, it's unforgiving and it's destructive. Consider relationships as occupying a space. In healthy ones, that space is fluid. It allows room for growth, for change. People move and adjust to accommodate each other's needs and aspirations. But in contrast, toxic relationships create rigid, unyielding spaces where there's no room for growth or individuality. Any attempt to break free from this mold is met with resistance and manipulation from a toxic partner who will do whatever it takes to maintain the status quo. Out of misplaced loyalty or a misguided sense of love, which is the most common, People may sacrifice their own growth and happiness to fit back into that constricted space. But eventually this just creates a soul-sucking sense of despair and resignation at being trapped once again in this stifling environment. So whilst leaving a toxic relationship is never easy, it is, I promise you, essential for your well-being and your happiness. And it's a courageous step towards reclaiming your freedom and your autonomy, even if it means enduring temporary discomfort. And I know it's easy to worry about all the time you've invested and about starting over. But leaving doesn't mean it was all for nothing. If it's not a blessing, it's a lesson. We can learn so much about ourselves and utilize that in any future relationships. Staying absolutely won't make things magically better. So whether you are 19 or 25 or 48 or 72, you deserve better. Are you staying because you are afraid of being alone? Are you staying because you don't believe you deserve better? Because I think a lot of women can relate to that need for validation that constant comparison, that feeling like we are never enough, because that's what we've been taught. But at some point, it will hit you, a moment of clarity where you realize, I love myself. And you realize your happiness isn't dependent on anyone else's validation. You deserve that. You deserve that happiness, that love and that fulfillment and do not let convenience or fear hold you back from finding it. And I promise you, although it can feel a little jarring to go from chaos to calmness because you're like, am I bored? (laughs) No, you're just safe. And safe isn't boring. Toxicity isn't true love and poison isn't passion. But the transition might feel unnerving for sure. But you can still have fun, adventure, wild sex, crazy times with someone who also cares about you and respects you. And I promise you, It all feels better when you are enjoying those times without a constant feeling of unease in the pit of your stomach. But it will take some getting used to, which, yes, is kind of fucked up, but it's where we are, so we got to move with it. Now, getting out of toxic relationships is going to be complex and nuanced, especially where there is abuse involved but I am offering up some strategies for trying to get out because it's a process that requires careful consideration and planning. First and foremost, it's essential to recognize and acknowledge the toxicity within your relationship. 
Take a close look at the dynamics between you and your partner or partners and identify patterns of behavior that are harmful, manipulative or controlling. Trust your instincts that toxic behavior is not normal or acceptable in a healthy relationship and you deserve to be treated with respect, kindness and compassion. Once you've recognized this, It's important to seek support from family, from friends, and even from a therapist. Talking to people that you trust will provide you with emotional support, validation, and guidance as you navigate this process of ending your relationship. A therapist, if that's accessible to you, can also offer professional guidance and help you develop coping strategies to deal with the emotional challenges of leaving a toxic relationship because as we've discussed, it's a fucking journey. Another crucial step is going to be setting some boundaries. This might involve expressing your needs, saying no to harmful behavior and enforcing consequences if those boundaries are violated which will probably be met with resistance or backlash from any toxic person. But it's more important to prioritize your well-being and stick to your boundaries. However, on that note, create a safety plan if you are concerned about that. This involves identifying safe places you can go to if you need to leave quickly as well as accessing resources for support. If you are dealing with particularly volatile or abusive situations, also, if you can, please consider seeking legal advice to protect yourself and your rights, especially if there are children involved. Yes, actual toxic behaviour is this fucking serious. And when you are planning your exit from the relationship, it's essential to strategize the best way to end things safely. Choose a time and place where you feel safe to have that conversation with that toxic person. Be prepared for various reactions from them. That might be denial, anger, guilt tripping, attempts to manipulate you, attempts to gaslight you, but stay focused on yourself and on your well-being and maintain your own boundaries during that conversation. After you have ended the relationship, it's important to cut contact as much as possible. This might mean blocking them on social media, avoiding places where you're likely to run into them and get help from your friends and from your family, even if it means to screen your calls or your messages if you are worried about harassment or unwanted contact. Focus on self-care when you navigate the aftermath of a toxic relationship. Take care of yourself emotionally, physically, and mentally by engaging in things that bring you joy. Practice some self-compassion. And I cannot emphasize it enough. You have to consistently and constantly prioritize your own well-being. And if you're in a really bad place, which it's likely a lot of people might be, consider seeking professional help or therapy. I've had to have it when coming out of toxic relationships. There's no shame in that. Consider getting help from a professional. That's what they are there for, to process your emotions and help you heal from the trauma of a toxic relationship because they are fucking traumatic. And there are professionals there to help support you as you rebuild your life and move forward. It's what I'm literally training to do. Like maybe at some point in the future, I'd like to hope that maybe this helps you not get into toxic situations in the first place, but maybe one day when I'm qualified, I will fucking help you get out of it, that's for sure. Also take time to reflect on the relationship and what you've learned from it. Identify red flags or warning signs that you might have overlooked in the past and use that knowledge to protect yourself in future relationships. And even if it was toxic, Allow yourself to grieve the loss of the relationship. That's okay. Healing takes time. And it's really important to be patient and compassionate with yourself whilst you navigate that process. But just constantly remind yourself that you deserve to be in a healthy, supportive and loving relationship. By breaking free from a toxic relationship, you are just reclaiming your power, your autonomy and your happiness. You are not alone in this journey 
and there are people and resources available to support you every step of the way. Stay strong, be kind to yourself and trust that there are brighter days ahead. Okay, it's time to get into your questions for today. And on the note of questions, I am now getting a lot more questions through to my not gonna lie link, which I am so appreciative of. And thank you to anyone who sends them in and trusts me with my thoughts on things you are going through. So I am also starting... Sunday Spooning with Peach, which will just be short mini episodes to answer some of the more general questions that are being sent in when there's a bunch that need answering, rather than being specific to a certain episode. So if you don't hear your question today, please tune in on Sunday and I promise it will be there. I will, as always, have an Ask Peach episode in the season, but do feel free to keep sending in your questions as and when you feel you want to, as the link is always open to all of you. But for now, let's get into today's toxic questions. My last relationship was very controlling. My life was controlled by her woman-loving woman relationship, including what I ate and how and when we had sex. I'm scared to open up to future partners about this as I was always told by my ex that no one would ever want to have sex with me because I was a size 12. Any advice? Well, first of all, I'm really sorry to hear that you went through that because that sounds fucking awful. And I've always found that when you find yourself in a controlling relationship, it literally feels like being stuck in a maze with someone else holding the map. And when your partner's decisions seem to dictate every aspect of your life, it's suffocating because it feels like you are losing your sense of self in the process. And you start questioning everything, wondering if your own desires and preferences even matter anymore. And pair that with hurtful comments about your size from your ex. That's not just a slight sting to the ego. That's a fucking tidal wave crashing over you because you're not just dealing with the emotional aftermath of a breakup. You're also grappling with body image issues and self-doubt. And that's going to feel like their words have imprinted themselves on your psyche. But you have to know that their behavior was a hellhole of toxic tactics. They were trying to isolate you and make you feel like they are the best you can get so that you are brainwashed into feeling lucky to have them. It's no wonder that you are going to feel hesitant to open up to future partners about this because there is going to be a fear lurking in the shadows of being judged or rejected all over again. You worry that they will see you through the same lens as someone who's not worthy of love or desire because of size. It's like carrying around a burden of shame and inadequacy, hoping no one will notice that weight that you are shouldering. But the thing is, that could not be further from the truth. You are so much more than a number on the scale. Whatever that number is, be it size 6, 16 or 60, you are more than the hurtful words of an ex. You are worthy of love, respect and acceptance absolutely as you are. Your worth is not defined by someone else's standards or opinions. So it's about embracing who you are and knowing that you deserve nothing but the best. Opening up about past trauma is no easy feat. It takes courage, it takes vulnerability to lay your heart on the line like that and if it is accessible to you, as you know, I will always recommend speaking to a professional if possible because they will be able to help you navigate these feelings. And also, we can sometimes take these feelings forward into our next relationships and blame a new partner for something an old partner did, which often comes from fear and resentment that just hasn't been acknowledged and worked through. And you have been through a trauma. An abusive relationship is a heavy, heavy trauma. And you might need some help with that. And as someone who has been in controlling and abusive relationships myself, I can't even express how helpful it was to see a therapist who specialized in that and work through it with them. 
But when you do decide to share your story with someone new, make sure it's with someone who deserves to hear it. Someone who will listen with empathy and understanding and who will support you on your journey of healing and also your journey of what's going to be self-discovery again. And please remember that healing is a process. It's okay to take things one step at a time and just keep prioritizing yourself for now. Surround yourself with people who uplift you, do things that make you feel good, that bring you joy, and just keep reminding yourself that you are deserving of all the love, respect, and happiness in the world, and don't settle for less than that. What your ex did was fucking awful, but you've got this, and please know that you are not alone on this journey. There are people who care about you and want to see you thrive. So please take a deep fucking breath, hold your head up high and keep moving forward, even if it's just tiny steps one at a time. But I promise you, it's going to get better. Next question. Where do you think the general manipulating or pushing someone's buttons a little to get what I want turns into just plain toxic behavior? I mean, (laughs) I get that it's natural for people to try and influence others or like nudge them in certain directions to get what they want because we literally see it all the time in our everyday interactions, whether it's persuading a friend to choose a restaurant for dinner or convincing a colleague to take on a task at work. But where does influencing cross the line into toxic behavior? I would say it's when those actions become coercive and the other person's feelings or autonomy are disregarded. It's like someone constantly pushing your buttons or playing mind games to get their way without caring how it makes you feel. That's where it gets toxic. Imagine you are in a relationship with someone who constantly guilts you into doing things you're not comfortable with. They use emotional manipulation to get their way and they just disregard your feelings in the process. For instance, let's say you um, express that you need some space to focus on your own interests or your own hobbies. But instead of respecting that, your partner becomes clingy and needy, bombarding you with messages and calls or making you feel guilty for wanting to spend time alone. That might mean saying things like, if you really loved me, you'd want to spend every moment together or you're being really selfish for not putting me first. So despite your attempts to assert some boundaries or just prioritize your own needs for a hot second, they persist in attempts to control you or play on your emotions or insecurities to manipulate you to comply with their desires. That is a pattern of behavior that doesn't just disregard your autonomy, but it also undermines the foundation of trust and respect. And I think that's where toxic dynamics can get created because your emotional well-being is just constantly compromised for the sake of someone else's agenda. And then there isn't just an immediate impact of actions like that. It becomes about long-term effects on a relationship and the people involved toxic behavior just completely fucks that because it breeds resentment and it creates dynamics of power and control. And that's really harmful to both parties. So it's crucial to just sort of be mindful of our intentions and the impact of our actions on others. And then we can find a balance between advocating for ourselves and respecting the autonomy and well-being of those around us. And if we find ourselves in situations where we feel uncomfortable or manipulated, it's also important to speak up and set boundaries to protect ourselves. But ultimately, healthy relationships, whether that's romantic, platonic, work, they're all built on trust and mutual respect and open communication, not manipulation or coercion. So if we are striving to keep those qualities in our interactions and we're always creating spaces where everyone feels valued and heard, then the odd little moment of persuasion isn't going to matter all that much because the people around you know that they are safe. I mean, I persuade my best friends to do random shit with me all the time, but if they were to be like, Peach, I really don't want to do that, I would respect it and they know that. So 
I think it's really about the environment these persuasions are happening in and just people knowing that they are respected in their decisions in the end, if that makes sense. I feel like I've really gone off on a tangent, but (laughs) that's just my opinion. I hope that helped. Um, Next question. Who is the most toxic person you know and do they know that they are toxic? Um, Well, I know a fair few, hashtag straight musical theatre boys, height 5, 10 or 11, but um, most definitely my ex-husband and no, he thinks he's great. So my only advice would just be don't make the same mistake I did, which was marry him. Okay, next question. Do you think there's more potential for toxic behaviour in friendships or relationships? That's actually a really interesting question. Um, I think that toxic behavior can really rear its head in any type of relationship, whether it's friendships or romantic relationships. But if I had to pick one, I'd say there's probably more potential for toxic behavior in romantic relationships just because when you are romantically involved with someone, the stakes are usually higher. There's just a deeper level of emotional investment, vulnerability, and obviously intimacy that isn't present in most friendships. Um, You're not just hanging out and having fun. You know, you're sharing your hopes, your dreams, your fears, and your body with this person. So there's like a different kind of pressure to meet each other's needs and expectations. And sometimes it's that pressure that can lead to unhealthy dynamics, like one partner feeling like they have to constantly sacrifice their own needs to please the other. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I think it's sometimes funny to see a transition if you are really good friends with someone and then you end up dating. The things that were fine when you were friends all of a sudden become a problem when you're in a relationship because I think in romantic relationships, there's then much more of a sense of possession or ownership over the other person, which I don't agree with, but we have to acknowledge that it very often exists. And that then ends up manifesting as like controlling behavior or manipulation, which I'd like to think there's less space at least to do in a friendship. And then I guess adding in factors like jealousy, insecurity, power dynamics, that creates more of a breeding ground for toxic behavior to thrive. And that's not to say that friendships are immune to toxicity, friendships can absolutely be fraught with their own challenges. Again, jealousy and competition and boundary issues, that can all come up in friendships too. And I guess sometimes friendships can mimic the dynamics of romantic relationships, especially if there's a strong emotional connection or like dependency. But yeah, while toxic behavior can happen in any type of relationship, I'd say more potential in romantic relationships just because of the nature of the dynamic. But at the end of the day, what really matters is focusing on building healthy, respectful relationships, whether they are romantic or platonic, because life gets quite simply mm, too short for toxic. (laughs) When does jealousy become toxic? Or maybe when does jealousy stop being a healthy concern and turn into toxic jealousy. Jealousy is a tricky one, and I think a little bit of jealousy is at least pretty common in relationships. I don't love it. I don't love jealousy and that it's something we possess because of what it can become. It just causes so many problems, and it feels so pointless because we can never be someone else. We can never have exactly what someone else has. So it feels like we spend time feeling threatened, which is really what jealousy is. You know, it's a it's a type of fear of other people and there's nothing we can do about it. And it's so annoying. And I mean, I guess if it's a little twinge that you might feel when your partner spends a lot of time with someone else or gets what you might consider a bit too friendly with a co-worker, I can understand it, sure, but that's because we've been taught such territorial ownership boundaries around our partners when really what we want to do 
is let our partners do what they want and then make the decision if that's going to really work for us rather than try and force them to do what we want. And we've also been taught that it can be kind of flattering, like it's a sign to know that your partner cares about you and doesn't want to lose you. But jealousy stops being as healthy as it can really possibly be when it starts to become all-consuming and controlling. It's like instead of just being a passing feeling, it starts to take over your thoughts and then your behaviours. And that kind of toxic jealousy can start to show up in all sorts of ways, whether that's constantly checking a partner's phone or social media accounts or accusing them of cheating without any evidence. It's just an ongoing feeling of insecurity and mistrust that will not go away no matter how much reassurance your partner gives you. And the thing is, it doesn't just hurt your partner that hurts you because it's a vicious cycle where the more jealous and controlling you become, the more you push your partner away, which just reinforces more feelings of insecurity and mistrust. And no one wants to be there. That's just not a fun or happy dynamic for anyone. So I think the line between healthy jealousy and toxic jealousy really comes down to how it impacts the relationship and the individuals involved. Even healthy, I'm using that very tentatively, jealousy can be a little uncomfortable at times, but I'd like to think it's ultimately rooted in love and concern for the relationship. And maybe sometimes it's just at least a sign that there's a conversation needed about something. And I think being honest about jealousy makes it much healthier. So if you own how you are feeling and have an open channel of communication about it, I think that makes a huge difference because we've been shamed to not admit that we are jealous about anyone or anything. Why? It's an emotion and it exists and it's valid whether we like it or not. And hiding it can be much more dangerous. So really, if we're like, hey, babe, I'm feeling jealous about X, Y, Z and here is why. Can we talk about it? Then you are at least dealing with jealousy in the healthiest way possible. Even when it gets toxic, it's still really just rooted in fear and insecurity, which again are valid emotions, but they need to be addressed. And it will just chip away at the foundation of any relationship if they're not. So if you find yourself struggling with jealousy in your relationship, then it is important to take a step back and examine where are those feelings coming from? Are they based on real evidence or are they just coming from a place of insecurity? And if it's the latter, it might be worth exploring those feelings further with a therapist or a counsellor who can help you work through them in a healthy and constructive way rather than projecting them onto friends or partners because honestly, that is just going to fracture your relationships in the long run. Thoughts on people with massively different body types. Why are we more positive about a big woman, smaller man, but against big men, smaller women? saying they are probably gold diggers. I mean, listen, any double standard when it comes to body types is frustrating as fuck. And to be honest, I'd love to know where this unwritten rule book in society that dictates what's considered attractive or acceptable based on gender comes from. Because when it comes to relationships where one partner has a significantly different body type than the other, there's all these fucking stereotypes and judgments that come into play. But I think... Your question is interesting because I would say that society generally favours bigger men and smaller women rather than the other way around. I never know where the questions are coming from in the world. So also I want to make space for different cultures and what might be considered attractive or socially acceptable in all of those cultures. But I would say Yeah, in the UK, it's definitely always felt like it's the other way around because I think there's a stereotype that larger men have usually been seen as more desirable or powerful. And I don't feel like you ever hear any comments made about 
if a bigger man is dating smaller women. But on the flip side, if a larger woman is dating a smaller man, there's all of these comments like, oh, he must be into bigger girls. So I definitely would say, in my experience, the judgments and stereotypes are sort of the other way around. But regardless of what way around we are looking at it, these assumptions are not only hurtful and unfair, they are also rooted in harmful stereotypes about gender attractiveness and worth. And the truth is, people are attracted to all different types of bodies for all different kinds of reasons. And there's no one size fits all explanation for why someone is attracted to someone else. And Let's not forget that attraction is so much more than just physical appearance. It's about personality, chemistry, shared values, and so many other factors that have nothing to do with what someone looks like on the outside. And the only reason we tend to be more positive about certain combinations of body types than others is due to bullshit societal norms and expectations around gender and attractiveness. So in my experience, I would say there's the idea that men should be bigger and more muscular while women should be smaller and more petite. And anything that deviates from that is seen as abnormal or unconventional. But the truth is there's no one right way to have a body and there's no one right way to be attracted to someone else. Love and attraction come in all shapes and sizes and we need to challenge ourselves to be more open-minded and accepting of that. Life is too fucking short to let arbitrary stereotypes dictate who we can and can't love and those are my thoughts on that question. Okay, now it took me a while to get some of these confessions out of you but thank you to those who did send some over and let's get into them. So, After a Tinder date with a penis owner, it was clear he wasn't around for a long time, just a good one, as the cringe bio line goes. He talked a good game, so I thought, sod it, I'll take him back to mine. Someone else giving you an orgasm is better than doing it yourself, right? Pillow princess (laughs) hit. So when we get to mine, he throws me in a good way against the wall, end up on the sofa for a little while. He tries to pick me up and take me to bed. He dropped me square on my back. I felt like a stranded turtle. But your girl isn't a quitter, so eventually get to bed. He suddenly forgets about any foreplay and he's just trying to go for the big O through penetration alone, which despite me trying to direct him, he would not listen. Not a faker, so I told him that I was done and my back really hurt, got shot of him, got back in bed and finished myself off with a few toys instead. The red flag should have been him dropping me, but we live and learn. Listen, all I hear is not a faker. And girl, I salute you. I'm here for it. It wasn't working for you. You tried. You said enough is enough. As much as I really hope your back was okay, I'm not hearing poison here. Only pleasure. (laughs) My ex gave me a hand job on It's a Small World in Disneyland. The boat was not empty also. Well, talk about turning Disneyland into the happiest place on earth. Nothing says magical like an unsuspecting boatload of fellow park goers witnessing your very own private show. I mean, it's really taking making memories to a whole new level. But listen, they do say that Disneyland is where dreams come true. And I suppose for you, it did. <laughs> My ex broke my heart but still used my Disney Plus. You best believe I waited until she got to the last episode of a seven season long show before I changed the password. Well, talk about sweet revenge. Or should I say streaming revenge? That was fucking awful, sorry. Well, I mean, listen, here's to taking back control of your digital kingdom, babe. When it comes to matters of the heart... Sometimes a little strategic password change is all it takes to reclaim your throne. An awkward side note, one of my exes did this to me. Babe, is that you? (laughs) Next, once I created a fake Instagram account so I could DM a girl I didn't know with proof that her boyfriend was cheating on her. Not with me, but with my friend and sent receipts. Toxic maybe, but girls gotta help girls. Okay, listen, I mean, it's true that creating a fake account and sliding into someone's DMs might not be the best approach, but it's not 
always easy to confront these kinds of uncomfortable truths. And I've been there. And I've definitely let people know some things via some unconventional channels in my time, especially when they involve people's relationships. But sometimes people have to speak up and shine a light on things that need to be addressed. It is a muddy area and fake Instagram accounts are rife. But I just hope that one day we can all just talk about this shit so we don't have to go around the houses to do so. I know that we aren't there as a society yet, but we can keep hoping. And I always appreciate honesty and integrity in a world that could definitely use more of both. I have no self-worth, confidence or any positive response towards myself. So often without consciously doing it, I will engineer a situation to gain praise or look smart or funny. Basically anything that's validating and this never stops. I mean, to be honest, the quest for validation is a journey many of us find ourselves on at one point or another. And It sounds that you're struggling with feelings of very low self-worth and confidence and you found yourself seeking validation from others to fill that void. But seeking validation from external sources is literally like trying to fill a leaky bucket because no matter how much praise or validation you receive, it's never going to feel like enough to truly make you feel whole. (laughs) And the solution is going to start with turning inward and at least trying to start learning to find that self-worth and confidence from within. And that's easier said than done, I know, but I promise you it is possible with time and effort. And you have to practice some self-care and self-compassion and treat yourself with the same kindness and understanding that you would offer a friend. So practice positive self-talk and challenge any negative feelings about yourself Remember that you are worthy of love and respect as you are. And it might be helpful to explore the root causes of your low self-worth and confidence. Are there past experiences or traumas that have contributed to these feelings? Therapy or counselling can be incredibly beneficial in helping you unpack and address these underlying issues if there are some. And try to shift your focus from seeking validation externally to finding fulfillment and validation from within. So that might just be engaging in things, activities that bring you fulfillment and joy. That might be pursuing hobbies, that might be spending time with loved ones. It might just be setting and achieving some personal goals, like literally make a list of things that you want to do. And I promise you, when you like tick that shit off, it starts to feel really good and it starts to feel really productive. And it just sort of gives you like a little bit more of like a sense of self. But please just keep remembering you are so much more than the praise or the validation that you receive from others. Your true self-worth is going to come from knowing and accepting yourself. Flaws and all because they are part of all of us and you just have to embrace your own unique worthiness you've got this I've got you you can do this I really have faith I'm a chronic people pleaser but also I'll form an attachment so quickly I'll act like we've been married 50 years five minutes after the first kiss add these together and I exclude everyone and become toxic to others around me in pursuit of pleasing that person I'm attached to trying to fix it though. Yeah, navigating attachment and people pleasing is really going to leave you feeling like you are caught in a whirlwind of emotions and expectations. Because when people become deeply attached to someone, it can be as if they become the sun around which the entire universe revolves. And in your eagerness to please, you're then going to lose sight of your own needs and desires and sacrifice your own well being in the process. But true love, true connection, it's not about losing yourself in someone else's. It's about standing side by side, hand in hand as equals. Supporting each other, yes, but also honoring your own individuality and autonomy. So how do you find that delicate balance between love and self-preservation? Well, it's going to start with learning to recognize your own worth and value independent of the opinions of others. That means setting some boundaries and learning to say no when necessary, even if it means risking disappointment or disapproval. And 
Most importantly, it means being willing to embark on a bit of a journey of self-discovery to explore the roots of your attachment patterns and people-pleasing tendencies, which might not feel like an easy road, but it's a journey worth taking because it's going to lead you to not only a deeper understanding of yourself, but also to richer and more authentic connections with others. People-pleasing is a whole thing that I will delve into maybe in its own episode, but it's complicated. And to move through it, you have to try and embrace your vulnerability and your complexity. Let's look to learning to love ourselves so fiercely and unapologetically that we can love others with equality. It's about finding that happy medium between attachment and autonomy, between pleasing others and honoring ourselves. And I'm very here for the self-awareness and don't look at yourself as something that needs to be fixed. You aren't broken. We are all just complex things trying to figure shit out. I like two guys at the same time, one as backup. Okay, listen, we may have all heard my toxic story from when I was about 19, dating two people and they both put the same train to come and see me, blah, blah, blah. I don't recommend that at all. I get it. We can feel drawn to multiple people at once, but it is important to approach this situation with honesty, both with yourself and with the people involved. Keeping one person as a backup plan is ultimately going to lead to hurt feelings and complications down the road. And I personally believe everyone deserves better than just being someone's backup. So I would take some time to reflect on what you truly want and need in a relationship. What qualities are most important to you? What kind of connection are you seeking? And if you find yourself developing feelings for multiple people, it is important to be transparent with them about your thoughts and feelings. And yes, that might involve having difficult conversations, but ultimately it's the most respectful and ethical approach. It's really important to consider the feelings of the people involved because how would they feel if they knew that they were being kept as a backup plan? How would you feel if the situation were reversed? Only you can determine the best course of action for yourself and those involved, but please do communicate openly and honestly. Love and relationships are complex and nuanced, but try your best to navigate this situation with integrity and compassion and everyone will be better at the other end of it, I promise. I was casually sleeping with this guy who would also kind of treat me like his wife and I was semi down for it. He then started, however, to text his ex, who is also married to someone else, by the way. And this is when I decided I didn't enjoy not being the only woman, even though I didn't really want to be with him in a relationship sense. Anyway, over Easter, he took me to Italy you. And whilst he was out on the driving range, emails popped up when I was in bed watching Netflix from this married woman saying I was evil and calculated. So I decided that enough was enough and that I was going to commit to an actual relationship to get rid of her. I realize now that that semi proves that I potentially was being slightly calculated. However, naturally, he obviously then didn't stop messaging her and the relationship lasted approximately one month. So thankfully, my own toxicity didn't ruin too much of my life. It was also a real wake up call for me and my self sabotaging ways. Listen, again, no surprises here. I kind of blame society because it's been so desperate to pit women against each other that we end up in these situations. We see others as competition. And sometimes is it even about the man or is it just about the feeling of winning? And if we allow ourselves to see other women as competition, then we give men the power to decide who wins. And the real answer is no one, no one wins. We end up fucking ourselves over and for what? Sorry, being left to watch Netflix while he's on the driving range in Italy. Like, why weren't you out drowning in pasta? You deserved better, boo, and we know better now. Okay, so as you know, I popped some polls out on Instagram to gauge what you feel is toxic or not toxic. Now, I know that every single situation comes with nuance and context. So sometimes it isn't as black and white as two singular options, but I just wanted to get some ideas. And here are the results. Drum roll, please. Number one, looking at a partner's phone behind their back. Toxic, 90%. Not toxic, 
10%. Who is this 10%? Like, even if you do it, surely you know that's not okay. Have I ever done it? Yes. Did I know it wasn't okay? Yes. This is not it. Whoever is in this 10% message me because we have to talk. Next one. Asking a partner to look at specific things on their phone. Toxic, 51%. Not toxic, 49%. Okay, this is such an interesting one and also so close. And I have to say, I don't know what I would say because I'm kind of here for the honesty of saying there's something I'm concerned about. Like it's involving your partner. It's honest. It's showing your partner that you respect them enough to ask rather than going behind their back. So I would say, I don't think it's toxic, but I would say if you are in a position that you have to ask that, and I say ask, not demand, then there's things that need addressing. That's a controversial one for sure. But I want people to tell me their thoughts on this one. So please let me know what you think. Saying goodnight over text, but staying online or your last scene being hours later. Toxic, 17%. Not toxic, 83%. Okay, good. Okay. I used to have an ex who would lose their shit at me if I dared to be on my phone after we had said goodnight and I wasn't doing a single untoward thing. Like, what if I want to talk to my best friend or I'm just not tired after you've gone to sleep? To be fair, I'm the most incognito on WhatsApp, like literally no blue ticks, no online status. So no one knows anything. I can't leave people on red because they don't even know if I've read it. (laughs) Is that toxic? (laughs) Using sex as a bargaining tool to get what you want. Toxic, 86%. Not toxic. 14%. Yes, it's toxic. Have I ever done it? Of course, I've used it and I've withheld it. And I remember one partner, because yes, I did this in more than one relationship back when I was a toxic totty, said to me that withholding was insulting because it suggested I only had sex for his sake in the first place. And friends, lovers, listeners, I never did it again. Unless this is a kink, that you and your partner actively and consensually engage in, it is giving toxic terrain. Ghosting, toxic, 78%. Not toxic, 22%. Obvs, as a communication queen, I do not like ghosting. While there may be understandable reasons for needing to end communication, ghosting can just leave people feeling confused, hurt and rejected. And in situations where there has been a mutual understanding that communication will continue, suddenly disappearing without explanation can be emotionally damaging. And it's not cute. It can leave the other person questioning themselves and the validity of the relationship or the interaction. And that lack of closure can impact the person's trust in future relationships. So whilst it may not always be intentional or malicious, I think it can have harmful effects on the recipient. And in my opinion, it contributes to at least a toxic dating culture, which is characterized by poor communication and a lack of accountability. So please do consider the feelings and well-being of others. Just communicate openly and respectfully, even when you are ending a relationship or an interaction. I'm looking at you, the 22%. Saying, sorry you feel that way. toxic, 68%, not toxic, 32%. Okay, I think this is a funky one. I've said this before to be a petty little bitch. And I think saying sorry, you feel that way can sometimes be perceived as really invalidating, depending on the context in which it's used. Because while the intention may be to acknowledge the other person's feelings, It comes across as insincere or deflective, especially if it's not accompanied by genuine empathy or understanding. So in situations where someone expresses hurt or frustration about something you've said or done, simply responding with, sorry, you feel that way without taking responsibility for your actions or offering further explanation can be seen as dismissive. It can imply that you're not willing to engage in a meaningful dialogue or address the underlying issue. I do think 
There are instances where saying sorry you feel that way can be appropriate, such as when you genuinely regret that the other person is upset, but you disagree with their interpretation of events. But in these cases, it's also important to follow up with open communication and a willingness to listen to the other person's perspective. I would say that the effectiveness of saying sorry you feel that way depends on the sincerity of the apology and the context in which it's used. It's just essential to consider the other person's feelings and always be willing to engage in constructive dialogue to resolve conflict. And that way you maintain healthy relationships. Not saying how you really feel to keep the peace. Toxic, 68%. Not toxic, 32%. Okay, so this was the one I received the most messages about because it's nuanced for sure. And I think that it's not a toxic behavior, but it's certainly a symptom of a toxic environment or situation. While it may seem like the easiest or most comfortable option in the short term, suppressing your feelings is just never going to be a good idea. By constantly prioritizing harmony over honesty, you will find yourself compromising your own needs and values, which can ultimately fuck your self-esteem and your self-worth. Additionally, withholding your true feelings can prevent genuine connection and intimacy in your relationships because it creates a barrier to open communication and vulnerability. However, I also have massive respect and understanding that some relationships do not have that safe space to do that. And I've been there and I get it. But I do think if you are in relationships in any capacity where you feel like you cannot say how you feel because it will only create conflict, then that is not healthy. Avoiding conflict by not expressing your feelings enables unhealthy patterns and behaviors to persist. Conflict isn't just a natural part of a relationship. It also provides opportunities for growth, understanding and resolution when it's approached constructively. Of course, there are times when it may be appropriate to choose your battles and prioritize harmony in certain situations. However, it's essential to strike a balance between maintaining peace and honoring your own feelings and boundaries. So this might mean learning how to assertively communicate your needs, how to set boundaries and how to navigate conflicts in a healthy and respectful manner. And if you are in a relationship where that is not a possibility, I promise you, it's time to get out. Okay, last poll for my favorite red flags, my walking concerns, my kryptonite. Straight musical theater boys between the height of 5'10", 5, 5'11". 5, now, before I say the results, I will say the majority who voted not toxic are people who fit this exact demographic. So please, may I suggest that some self-awareness be exercised in future, my kings. The results are... <laughs> Toxic, 78%. Not toxic, 22%. Ugh, I still love you. Friends, lovers, listeners, a little something different to end today's episode. As I've had on my Instagram this week, I'm doing a giveaway of the Balesa Air Vibe and I want to thank everyone who entered and I hope it brings you so much pleasure through good old Masturbation March. So here we go. The winner picked out of my oh-so-glamorous baseball cap was Ashling Reed. Love, love, love. I'm so excited for you. I cannot wait to get it to you ASAP. Happy fucking Masturbation March. Enjoy. Now, I literally never want to say the word toxic again. From now on, you will catch me saying, that sounds like very bad (laughs) behaviour. But I will be back very soon with my first guest of the season. And as we finish up today, please remember, when it comes to toxic, it might be fun when you're young, but it's a moan when you're grown. Until next time, thanks for coming. Thank you for tuning in to Sex on the Peach today and I hope that you enjoyed this week's episode. 
You can find and follow me on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Sex on the Peach Cast. And you can also get in touch with me at Sex on the Peach Cast at gmail.com. Please do continue to like, share, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And I'll see you next week. Love.